All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Minson. Welcome to the Kennedy School uh, Conflict Management and Depolarization Seminar. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today, Professor Lori Weingart, who is visiting us from the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Lori's research examines collaboration, conflict, and negotiation with a focus on how differences across people both help and hinder effective problem solving and innovation. Um, today, uh, Lori is going to talk about ongoing work on conflict expression. Um, and then if we have any time at all, I'm hoping she might give us a couple tiny little hints about her upcoming book, The No Club. Uh, Lori, uh, please take it away whenever you're ready. Um, we're going to uh, sort of ask you to kind of hold your questions until there's a bit of a pause uh, and Lori has a chance to invite them uh, because of sort of the dynamics of Zoom. Um, but I'm going to also keep an eye out for hands and keep an eye on the chat in case uh, in case folks have sort of burning, burning issues. Great. Thanks, Julia. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and see if I need to move any windows around. Hold on one second. There's my controls. Let's get this off the screen. Okay, I think, can you all see my slides okay? Excellent. All right, I'll get started. Uh, again, thanks for having me. I'm still doing one more adjustment. Okay, there we go. Um, it's great to be here. It's definitely not the same, not being physically present with you, but I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that I've been doing over the past several years. Um, for those of you who know me, uh, I've been a negotiation and a conflict researcher for my um, entire career. I've been doing, looking at mostly in team contexts, uh, looking at interacting groups. The as I moved from negotiation to conflict research, I started thinking about how people can use negotiation to resolve conflict. And it very much got me focused on communication. I've always taken a communication approach, like many of you have, to looking at conflict and the resolution of conflict. The work I'm gonna talk about today focuses on conflict expression, which is how we communicate conflict and zeroing in not only on how we communicate it, but how we experience the expression of conflict from others and, and ourselves. So really recognizing the role of the individual in the conflict um, dynamic. Now, the majority of research on conflict in teams has focused on the efficacy of different types of conflict, especially in the organization behavior literature, uh, considering differences between task, process, relationship conflict, and even more recently, you know, conflict over status. So there's been a, you know, a whole huge stream of work on types of conflict. My work is a little different in that um, I focus on the experience of conflict expression. When I talk about conflict expression, um, I'm recognizing the fact that it's not just what we're talking about, but how we say it that matters and the way we engage in the conflict itself. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I mean by conflict expression, just give you a definition from a paper we published in 2015. And then I'm going to build on that to talk about the more recent work looking at how people experience the conflict, how we think about those experiences and their effects at the individual level, and then perhaps more importantly, how we experience it at the group level or how we aggregate it up and think about the experience of conflict expression in a group. Uh, if I have time also, besides talking about the book, which is on a completely different topic, if I wanna also share a little bit of work that I'm doing with someone many of you know, Mike Humans, trying to actually code, objectively code conflict expression in teams. Okay, so with that, I will move forward and I just lost you guys, okay. All right, so I wanna share a little bit um, about what I mean when I say conflict expression. And I think the easiest way to share that is just to give you a very simplistic scenario. Uh, so imagine a situation where you have a conflict between two people, we'll call them Tom and Mary. Uh, and Tom and Mary are having a disagreement over budget allocations for the next fiscal year. 
So here's one version of the conflict. Um, Mary tries to explain why she believes the alloc allocation is adequate and even provides a bit of discretionary funds to the project. Tom listens, but remain concerned, remains concerned. Uh, Tom suggests that Mary may not understand the hidden costs in the situation and that they may want to discuss the issue further. Mary disagrees. Okay, so there's a conflict. There's a task conflict over budget allocation. Maybe there's a little implication about the interpersonal piece of it and respect for one another. Okay, uh, there's a little bit of process going on there as well. So here's the same conflict expressed differently. Mary defends her reasoning and unequivocally states that the allocation is adequate and might even be more than is needed. Tom interrupts her before she's finished. Tom asserts that Mary does not have the expertise to see, see the hidden costs in the situation and demands they reopen this issue. Mary disagrees. Okay, clearly these two versions of the same conflict about the same content is different. It, uh, and what we did in, in a paper published in 2015 is look at this in terms of two underlying dimensions, uh, looking at how the opposition is communicated, both in terms of um, its intensity and its, direction, its directness. So what I wanna do is, um, share with you, just start with the model. So what we presented in 2015 is uh, basically a, a framework laying out different types of communication of conflict, looking at the distinctions between directness and intensity. Um, so conflicts can be expressed with more or less directness and directness would be defined in terms of its ambiguity or clarity or it could be in terms of who is involved in the communication. Is it between antagonists or is it involve other people? Okay, so are, are we directly communicating with one another? Are we talking to other people about the conflict? Um, conflict expressions can also differ in terms of their intensity. And we can think about this both in terms of the attack and defend, right? So, I can become more um, intense in my subversiveness of actions. So I can try to undermine you. I can try and subvert your ability to get your work done. Um, that would be high intensity and in the subversiveness uh, dimension, or I can become more entrenched, I should say, and I can become more entrenched in my positions. It also influences the intensity of conflict expression, right? So these things go hand in hand. So in the 2015 paper, we talked about um, directness and intensity of conflict expression as a way to think about how people communicate conflict and the potential downstream influence it can have on uh, conflict escalation. So we built this, what we were saying wasn't brand new, but what it did is it pulled together a whole host of literature um, from many different fields that uh, um, really uh, built this framework and made it just a very intuitive way to think about conflict expression. What we also argued in that paper was that the ex people experience conflict differently, that we can be in the same conflict and experience different levels of intensity, right? So my cultural background, my gender, my experience, my, um, my role in the conflict, if I'm an observer, a participant, if I'm high status, if I'm low status, all these things can influence my perception of how intense the expression is. Uh, can also, we can differ in our perceptions of the directness in terms of what we consider very direct versus indirect. So some cultures where they use much more indirect communication, um, the directness, it would, uh, a, a um, statement would feel very direct where for someone else would be very indirect, right? So, and, and whether we can infer meaning. So the, the point that we, the jumping off point here is that there are also differences in how conflict is experienced, right? So we can take that same conflict and look at Mary's experience versus Tom's. So Mary might've experienced in term, in, in that uh, from her perspective that she was trying to explain she was, um, she was being low intensity and very direct, where Tom, Tom was the one who was um, escalating, right? Where Tom may have had the opposite experience, feeling that Mary was the one who was being defensive. He was listening and being um, integrative not and being uh, open to the other's perspective. So certainly we can have different experiences. 
So this is not um, surprising, I hope. We all know we have different experiences, uh, but, and, we, and many of our perceptual measures in the social sciences are designed to measure experience, right? Our perceptions, our social, exper our, our, our social perceptions. Uh, so asking people about their experiences of conflict expression is no different, right? Um, what's little different about the approach we're taking though, is that we're recognizing that because people have unique experiences of conflict expressions, we shouldn't just treat them in the group as an aggregate, but we need to somehow recognize it and integrate that into our theories and into our ways of measuring conflict. So um, we're recognizing the fact that in the same group, people will have different experiences in, ter in terms of the same event, and they may participate differently in the conflict. So as a result, they see it from a different perspective and therefore have a different experience, right? So, and there's been recent research by other people recognizing this. So if I'm an observer versus a participant, I'll have a different experience. Um, if, it, if the conflict starts within a dyad in the group and then um, it becomes, you know, kind of is like a contagion through the rest of the group, it will affect others differently and so on. All right, so if we recognize that, then we, when we think about this conflict expression at the group level, we need to recognize the fact that um, we should, that averages don't capture the full extent of what conflict is, how conflict is, um, growing and um, spreading throughout the group. So rather than focus on an average, which is what we typically do when we study team conflict, right? We, we average people's um, perceptions together and we assume that if everyone agrees, we're capturing reality of the group. And if we don't have agreement among participants in the team, then we don't know what's going on. There's no agreement, so we can't capture it. So we're, well, many researchers, or several researchers now, including ourselves, are saying, wait a minute, we don't want to assume that just because people have different perceptions, there's not a shared reality. There is a shared reality, but it's better represented as a configuration rather than as an average. So what we're trying to do is say, recognize the fact that averages and even standard deviations, which have been traditionally used as measures of consensus, and consensus measures of experiences and groups aren't adequate in this context. And instead we want to move beyond them to look at the distribution and the configuration of these different experiences in the group. And I'm gonna talk more about this next um, and recognize that these, in addition to the magnitude or the average, this distribution is gonna have an important impact on subsequent outcomes, proximal and distant outcomes in uh, group outcomes. So before I move, well, let me just show one more slide actually before I move on or a couple more. Okay, so when I talk about experience conflict expression, we take these two dimensions of intensity and directness and combine them to focus on the experience. What do people experience in terms of conflict expression? So directness and intensity are more latent constructs that underlie the actual experience that we uh, label these four different archetypes, right? So for example, in a situation where there's direct and low intensity communications, we, could, we think about these as debates, right? There's not a lot of entrenchment. People are deliberating, going back and forth, right? Low intensity, high directness. If we were to increase the intensity, we, you, um, the experience of this is more of an argument right, entrenched verbal exchanges, they are fights, disputes, and so on. Uh, when, in, when directness is low and intensity is high, these are, uh, include a set of behaviors that are more undermining in nature. So they're intense in the, in the um, way that they are very subversive and people may be very entrenched, but the communication of them is unclear, right? They're ambiguous. So, and, and we identified three subdomains of, in, that included dismissive behaviors, complaining to other people about the, your counterpart, and even teasing, mean teasing, right? Where we make fun of a person. So we're undermining them, but in a very indirect way. 
And then at the very low end, where it's low directness and low intensity, we, are, we look at disguised behaviors. So these are the conflict expressions that are vague and avoidant to the, to the extent that you're not even sure if there's a conflict going on, right? But something's going on here, someone's pushing back on you and you're, you're not sure if you should acknowledge it or not or what to do. Okay, so what, I what we like about our framework and what is useful is by including these more indirect ways of expressing conflict, we're getting a broader way people express opposition to one another, right? And, and going beyond just the um, more traditional kind of verbal exchanges. All right, the last thing I wanna do before I pause for questions is uh, show you that, so we did develop a self-report measure of conflict expression uh, where we have three items of each of these different forms of expression that match to the archetypes that um, we validated um, in multiple, multiple samples. So we have a nice validated scales that really holds a stable factor structure um, and has nice convergent and discriminant validity. So when I report on, I'm gonna report on argue, debate, undermine and disguise, the four, these will be the items that people will have responded to. So before I move on, any clarifying questions out there? Because the next thing I'm going to talk about is the some I'm um, going to show you some data of how at the first at the individual level these like these um, experiences of conflict expression predict individual psychological states. Okay, I'm now moving. All right, so I do. Let me wait. wait hold on. I think. Yeah. I just see, yeah, yeah. You, I think I saw Jared like physically raise his hand, but that's because I see him I just, in my window. I just didn't really have time to grab the button, but um, sorry about that. Thanks, Laurie. This is um, fascinating. Um, I wanted to just ask a clarifying question about your cultural difference. Um, the, the when you alluded to the fact that there might be differences in. Yeah. perceptions among people from different backgrounds right it just struck me that there might also be a difference in whether one of these dimensions if you don't mind going back one slide influences the other dimension so like mm -hmm. for example in some contexts if i'm indirect that could be worse than being direct in other words the valence might even be flipped between the two Maybe valence is the wrong word. The Thank directionality you. might actually be flipped where low is bad in one case and low is good in another case. And yeah. similarly, it could flip on intensity too. Sometimes if the other person isn't intense, that suggests they're not honest, they're not being truthful and candid with their feedback. I want them to be intense. Otherwise, I think they're not trustworthy. Right. Um, yeah. And then I also think they could interact with each other in the sense that something could feel more intense when it's indirect, because I think, wow, the person's really being backstabbing now when they're being indirect. I wish they would be more direct and then it would feel less intense. Yeah. Yes. Isn't it cool? Right. Like there's so many different <laughs> ways you can look at this and use this, this language to think about the, the experience, the perception, the dynamics. I think there's a lot of traction we can get from the framework. In the, end of, in the um, initial theory paper that we had, we, we didn't take it to the level that you're taking it. We introduced the framework, but we didn't really, and we introduced kind of some of the obvious differences based on culture and what happens when you get two people together who differ between themselves in terms of directness uh, perceptions you know, so we, we kind of explored that and talked about conflict escalation. I think what you're talking about um, are all dynamics that could happen and we need to be a bit agnostic or at least more expansive in our theorizing about all the different ways this can play out when you bring diverse people together yeah. and diverse experiences together. And that's why, I, you know, it's so important to break that frame that a group is a unit and, and they all need to be the same. Yeah. And, and psychologists, you know, when I say that, they're like, of course, like, that's the most ridiculous thing. Of course, they people are different. But unfortunately, some of the lit, our literature in this area hasn't recognized it. And so it's time to recognize it and integrate it into our theorizing and our empirics. That's exciting. Thanks. Thanks. Anything else out there? I, 
I think we're good. Okay, I'll keep moving on and maybe just speak up or I don't have everyone's views. So, or just let me know if you have a question. Okay, so now I wanna move on to looking at the effects of the experience of conflict expression on individual psychological states to show you that, oh, that if we measure these things over and above the more traditional measures of conflict, we're getting some traction. Okay, now in our, I do have a paper, I think I sent it ahead of time that, um, but I can share that's currently under review that um, has, a, we lay out predictions and they're kind of what you would expect. We start with the basic predictions of how debate is a more positive conflict expression, um, whereas undermine, disguise and um, uh, argue tend to have more negative effects on outcomes and information. Uh, so we're gonna kind of take the obvious here and go with that. All right, um, so this is this first table I wanna show you, and, and really what's important is to look at the colors here. Uh, so what we have here is, we, uh, this was um, a Turk Prime sample of working adults full-time that worked in teams. So we first asked them do you, if they worked in teams, they could select in, describe the team, tell us about it. So we got, really got their head into it. And then we asked them to think about um, conflict and they, they filled out the conflict expression scale. So when they have a conflict, what approach do they typically use? And then um, we asked some questions of, of uh, outcome variables, and one of them was information acquisition. Uh, so I'm going to show you trust and information, kind of, you know, two very important outcomes in, in work teams. In uh, so we can think of information acquisition in terms of learning and like integrating other people's perspectives into my own. Um, and what we see here is, so what I have here are the argue, debate, undermine, and disguise measures. And then I have the three traditional measures of conflict type task, process, and relationship. And then I have four or five measures of conflict management approach. So these, this is the Dutch scale, which is a, a um, well-used, highly used measure to say, um, we, we uh, reframe this in terms of the team. So this, does the team tend to use compromising to re resolve conflict? How much do we use problem solving, avoiding, forcing, and yielding? Because you can imagine those are closely related to whether we argue, debate, undermine, or disguise in our conflict expression. And what we see, you know, in the first, here we have in the first model, we just have the four conflict expression. And we see that the, the effects on information acquisition are pretty stable. Uh, re regardless of when we add in the different types of controls. And the reason I don't have them all in one equation is we they um, there's so much conflict um, intercorrelation among them, sometimes the model explodes. So uh, this is about 400 respondents. We have other data sets too, where we basically get the same thing here. Um, so we started feeling good. Okay, so over and above kind of these traditional measures, it's worth measuring conflict expression in terms of learning. Um, the next question he said, well, what about trust? And we're seeing, we actually get more leverage here in arguing with trust than we did with um, information, which is interesting in and of itself. But again, we see these stable, largely stable effects. More overlap with the um, conflict management approaches than with conflict type, which kind of makes sense. So getting a little bit of uh, validity here. All right, so that's important but it's not the main contribution of the work. Um, all right, I see there's something in, yeah. And yeah, someone, meant, oh, that was you, Jared. <laughs> Problem solving, important, yes, it is. Okay, love it, yeah. Okay, so the, the bigger contribution though of the work is saying, how do we think about this at the group level? Now that we know it matters for individuals, let's think about it at the group level. And how do we capture configurations of conflict, of experiences of conflict expression? So we asked two questions. Do teams exhibit identifiable configurations? And do configurations predict group emergent states and performance over and above the group average? So that's our questions in, in the paper that, we're, that I'm gonna talk about now. We develop a set of research propositions um, of what we expect. And so we're using a bit more of an inductive approach in this paper, um, although we do have some hypotheses um, and you know, research propositions. Okay, so we're of course starting with the assumption that some team members will have different experiences than others and that configurations will predict outcomes over and above the magnitude. 
And, and our expectation is that debate, right? So remember, so I'm gonna show you what the configurations mean. I'm gonna show you the different configurations, but generally we have different um, propositions about debate versus argue, undermine and disguise. So debate being a more positive dynamic, direct and low intensity makes things easier to understand and process. The idea here is more is better, regardless of how it's distributed among group members, that if three people are debating or only two, if there's a good amount of debate, as long as it's happening in the group, it's a good thing. Unshared configurations may have a impact, but maybe only small and incremental. Uh, we think though that for argue, undermine and disguise, which so either it's intense and or indirect, um, these are more problematic expression modes. More is worse, right? But unshared configurations could mitigate the negative effects. So if we have somebody in the group or, or a subgroup within the group who are having lower, less experience with, they're, they're perceiving less arguing, undermining and disguising, then that may help balance the group out in terms of how they're, um, uh, and avoid the conflict escalation that could occur, okay? All right, so you see, because Jared spoke recently, I see his face on my screen and he's like, he's, he's puzzled. So I almost wanna stop for a second and say, Jared, are you puzzled? <laughs> You're good? Okay, I'm gonna keep going, but feel free. I know Jared well, so I, I keep calling on him. All right, all right, so let me talk, let me back up now and talk about the configurations a little bit. What do I mean by configurations? Um, there's basically five configurations that we can talk about easily in small groups and we can capture, right? So the first is a, sh a shared experience where everyone has the same experience of, let's say argue we're talking about. Um, or we can have a group where one person is a very high, experiences a very high level of arguing and the other three are low, that's the minority high. Or minority low, where one person's low and everyone else is high bimodal, two are low, two are high, or fragmented, everybody's different. Okay, so that's what I mean by configurations. And we, um, uh, Daru has a nice paper where he uses these configurations theoretically to talk about differences in team efficacy, perceptions of efficacy, but they never measured it. They didn't capture it. And we're going to, we did. And that's what's, I think, really cool is we found a way to code teams for these configurations and, and using an algorithm. Okay. Um, so, but, so in terms of a shared configuration, all team members have a similar experience. And in this situation, uh, team average really nicely captures the team experience, right? Because there's not a lot of variation among people. Um, and so, you know, we kind of expect that at the group level, the results should be similar to what we see at the individual level in terms of a shared configuration. But we use this as our baseline. So the assumption is that there's sharedness and when we, when we model it, um, using dummy variables, it's gonna be in comparison to the shared configuration. All right, a bimodal, I mean, oh, sorry. Next we'll talk about minority high or low, kind of similar things here, where um, you know, the, the, the prediction of what would happen would, be, would depend on how this minority member influences the rest of the group, right? So are they a counterbalance to the group dynamic or are they exacerbating some group emergent state in some way because of their difference. So, um, so in the paper, we, we um, explore these a little bit more. You know, a minority member might challenge the team to think differently, enhancing learning. Uh, they could be a calming influence. Uh, and, and actually we think that's maybe what's happening in some of the um, negative uh, conflict expression forms. All right, a bimodal group, right? So we have kind of sub subgroups who are having different experiences and depending on how these arise, we might expect different things. So you can imagine if we have two subgroups interacting with one another and one subgroup is arguing a lot and the other isn't, that's gonna be different than if everybody's in the same group and some are experiencing the, sub the um, arguing and some don't see it at all. But regardless, you know, we can look to see how the subgrouping of experience might influence um, the development of trust in a group, the, um, the, the, the amount of learning that can take place and so on, you know, if it's a psychologically safe environment where we can hold different beliefs or not. All right. Lori? Yeah. 
Hi. <laughs> My Zoom is terrible, so I keep popping in and out. Um, but I, I lost a little bit track of, are we talking about conflict behaviors as sort of they're enacted, or are we talking about perceptions? We're talking of, about perceptions. Okay. And it's very easy for me to slip into behavior language. And so I apologize if I do that. I try not, but it's really about perception. So, um, but, but be, the behavioral experience can influence the perceptions or the individual differences or their role in the group. So a lot of things affect these perceptions. Behaviors can be one of them, but now we're talking about perceptions here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, one more kind of follow up on that. Is it, so when you say sort of like perceptions, let's say of debate or perceptions of arguing, is it my beliefs about do people argue a lot or is it my beliefs about how normative it is to argue, which are very similar things, I guess, but uh, like, it is it okay is. to argue or is it like people just like are arguing irrespective of whether I think it's okay or not? It is, it, it is that people are arguing. Okay. When we have a conflict, it, it's an argument. Like arguing is our modus operandi, you know, more so. So there's like, you know, a scale from, a, you know, high to low or low to high, but it's saying that like, this is our go-to approach or a typical thing for us to do when we have conflict. So I'm really looking at this in the expression of opposition, right? Okay. Yeah, when, gotcha. when there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. All right, then the fragmented um, situation is one where every, you know, certainly everybody's different. They don't share perceptions of how much conflict there is or maybe what, how much conflict of expression of a specific type. And um, you know, there's not gonna be any subgrouping in this case. Um, it may make it easier for members to share their experiences with one another, seek understanding of others if we're kind of all coming at it differently. Um, there's a lot of literature out there on different, you know, uh, we can look at um, diversity, uh, different types of um, composition of groups that we can lean on, right, to do to come up with theory and predictions. So my goal here isn't to come up with the perfect predictions and model, it's to show you that these configurations can exist and they matter. And we need to have theory and understanding to capture this, not just for conflict expression, but perhaps for a lot of the things that we study, the attitudinal things that we study in, in teams. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of data now. Uh, so um, we, in order to get some control over the work that people were doing to get make it compar comparable, uh, we went to MBA student teams. So this is a smallish sample. Um, but remember, we're looking at this both, at, we're doing a multi-level model here. So we have 41 MBA student teams, four to six members. Uh, they had worked intensely together for six weeks across a series of courses. So these are, uh, it was, this is an MBA program that uses kind of set teams in their core. And at the end, they engage in a weekend long high stakes case competition. Okay, so that's the, the situation. So they're very invested. They've worked together. They've developed their, um, norms of interacting already. And they've had a lot of, there's already been a good amount of conflict in their team. So before the case competition, we wanted to get capture their typical approaches to conflict expression. So we measured it before the case competition. And then we looked at their performance on the case competition and their experiences during the case competition in terms of learning and so on. All right, to try and get some time separation. Um, we uh, The other thing we did is, so we, we captured their experience of conflict expression, and then we um, put it through an algorithm we developed uh, to classify the groups in terms of their configurations for each type of conflict expression. So let's say if I'm, we have a group, we have four scores on argue for the group, because there's four, let's say it's a four person group. We could, we, we um, and we have this up on, um, uh, open science framework where you can look at it, but we, we developed an algorithm and we have the code for it that you can run to um, classify the groups. And basically it relies on 
uh, kind of traditional group level dispersion statistics, uh, agreement within group, RWG, skewness, and excess kurtosis. Um, and these are criteria for identifying meaningful similarity and differences between individual scores. So clusters and gaps, right? We're looking for clusters and gaps. And, and, um, uh, and, and we also ran this against hand coding of these groups to say, um, using another method to get some iterator reliability that we report. And, and it seems to be relatively robust and it's predictive. I'll show you that as well. Okay, so we classified. Then um, we collected after their case competition, self-report of in, in information acquisition, trust, satisfaction with the team, team potency, some of these important outcomes. And we also have expert ratings of their team performance. So they had to perform, they had to present their uh, you know, solution for the case. And so we do have those ratings, get a little bit of traction out of those. We'll sh I'll show you that as well. Okay. So the first question is, hey, do these like configurations even exist? All right, so here, these are hard to see. Just look at the colors, okay? And, or look closely if you can, I realize it's a little light. But basically what you have here is, uh, sorry, argue, debate, undermine, and disguise. The shared configuration, which is our baseline is the blue. Okay, so you can get a sense of what proportion of groups were classified as shared configurations. Um, undermine was the highest, uh, disguise was the lowest. Uh, the next most popular configuration was minority high, uh, especially for argue and undermine and, um, and disguise. So the three kind of more negative expressions. That means one person was high on undermine and the rest was low. Okay, so only one person had that experience. That was a common, especially in disguise, which just kind of makes sense, right? Because it's kind of hidden. People don't really know what's going on. Um, and then the next common one, you see minority low, which is the opposite, was pretty high for debate. Um, you know, we have some bimodal distributions happening and argue debate in disguise. So we're getting some variance here. So it's saying, okay, these, these they're here. And by the way, when we do traditional like inner like team inter intergroup agreement, it's not good, right? So we know there's low inter-rater reliability, intergroup inter agreement, the RWGs aren't great. So we, we and, and you probably their highest, it would be then for the um, undermining, okay? All right, so next our question was, do these configurations predict group emergent states, right? So the, the output I showed at the individual level was also from HLM, but where we, we um, ran the individual model, here we're running the group model. So this, we also controlling for the individual variation. Um, and what we were looking for is, are we getting traction anywhere from anything? Like, is it worth doing this, right? So the first line is magnitude. Remember, this is all at the group level here. So the average in the group, and then this is minority high, this line, sorry, I'm pointing the wrong screen, versus shared right, minority low versus shared. And what we're seeing is that if we capture these different configurations for these, and each column is each of the different experiences of conflict expression, we're getting some explanatory power here or there, right? So, and what, if you look at these, what's interesting, so this is information acquisition and trust, you're seeing that largely, the configurations of argue and undermine and disguise are positive, right? So when a configuration has an effect, when it's not shared in a meaningful or non-meaningful way, but when it's unshared, you're getting, uh, it's helping the group in some way, right? So maybe they're getting more information, maybe they're developing more trust. This is starting to say, okay, this is not a huge sample, but we're starting to see some um, traction here. Here's satisfaction with the team and, and perceptions of team potency. So again, kind of similar um, patterns. Okay, so argue, undermine, and disguise. We're not getting a lot on the magnitude here. The average isn't really capturing it. It's the, it's the, it's the, um, configurations that are giving me traction. Okay. Lori, there's a question from Jared in the chat. 
Uh, Jerry, you want to say it in words? <laughs> oh, sure. I'm just, um, I'm really interested in minority low, minority high, because I actually feel like just my intuition is that's where tension happens in the group when there's a minority viewpoint yeah. that's discrepant from the majority. And it's like a time bomb ticking for that group that there's going to be some problems down the road. So I'm fascinated by that one. And my question was whether you're restricting minority to one or can a minority be two? For example, in a group it can of be two. Six, two the answer is in the minority. Yeah, so it can be two. So we had a set of decision rules about how that would work. We have small groups here. So, you know, once you get to like, a, if you have a group of six people and it's two and four, and there's, we had to have a gap of say one point on the scale in between, then we could, we could call it minority. There's a minority group. So there's a two versus a four and there's a gap in between. If it was three and three and a gap in between, it would be bimodal. If it was, you know, so, or whatever. So yes, so it could be one. So you can't do this with groups smaller than four. I mean, this wouldn't quite work. Right, but to assess, I guess what I'm thinking, the reason, the basis for my question is I'm trying to think of discriminant validity between your categorizations of minority, high, low, and bimodal. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that bimodal could mean the same thing as minority. Like combining those categories could actually give you the same result, or it might not. And I don't even know how statistically you yeah. would test that, but I just want to know the discriminant validity of yeah, that. That's a good question. I don't, would I combine the bimodal with the minority high or the minority low? Um, I actually think you should try it both ways, but it would be really interesting to know whether it matters. Because yeah. I just want to know if there's something special about the minority or if it's just variation. Right, right. Well, and what's interesting about this is, is it's suggesting that there's someone who's, that people are different from each other, right? Which which may suggest a standard deviation would work right. as, a, that, that's, as opposed to a configuration, right? right. And so, so yeah. You know, yeah, if you just right. added standard deviation as another independent variable, would it swamp everything and make everything go to zero? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because um, that's kind of like the straw yeah, man. The problem that's is used they're capturing the so they're capturing so much of the same thing. I think it, it would it it would blow it up, you know, because these are different forms of standard deviation. So I'd have to think about how to do that. But that's a really good point. You know, what's interesting though is we do see that. Um, in some of these that they're working in opposite directions. So like, look at disguise, right? We have, I mean, they're non-significant, but minority high is moving in one direction. Minority low is moving in another direction. Bimodal is more similar to the minority lo low in that they're both positive, right? But in other, other categories, like undermining, any type of deviation that's minority high, low, or bimodal is leaning positive but the fragment is, is leaning negative. So there's patterns here that are suggesting it's not just straight standard deviation, but I think you're right, I'll have more power. Um, you know, I, I don't have a theory to say, you know, which way to move things or how, but, but the standard deviation, and I think we ran a model with standard deviation, but I think we're gonna need to look at that again. Yeah, cool. thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, all right. Um, so team performance. So this one's a, this one's a tougher one because it's a distal outcome, right? So what we see here is really the magnitude is giving us a little bit more traction, the average with, these are the, um, not the professors, these are actually outside experts from the company that they did the case study for evaluating their final presentations. So the fact that we get anything here, I think is, you know, for even magnitude is good, but this is a harder one. So we ran another study to say, well, let's look at a, a task where the performance is more proximally tied to the process, team process. And so here was, here's just some data from a um, teams working on a cascade survival task, 140 teams, you know, MBA students. So, you know, two, a short-term task. And we're starting to see, well, the bimodals, you know, configurations are having a little bit of, of leverage here, but not the uh, other unshareds. So it, it, it seemed like the groups who had a bimodal distribution of their um, conflict experiences, expression experiences, were the ones who actually did a little bit better. 
So it could be two people were arguing and two people were listening. We don't know if it was behavioral or, it was added, or if it was experience, but we know that they're all in the same group. So of course, the next step would be to look at their objective behavior. And I'm gonna talk about that next. Okay. So what I hope so far I've convinced you is that there's some value in looking at these configurations. Um, we're starting to get some traction from them in terms of uh, performance. And, and I think what I need to convince you more so is it, it's better than using standard deviation. So I'll have to make sure I get that in there. Okay. Lori. Yes. So I'm starting to feel like like, would it be fair to say that you could basically write four different papers about, you know, you take, like you take arguing and then basically say, rather than measuring the average level of perceived arguing or the variance in the level of perceived arguing, there's sort of important information you could gain by measuring it in terms of these configurations. Mm -hmm. And then since, arguing mostly has a negative effect. If you measure it as sort of the average, then the configurations could like make that effect more or less negative depending on how it's configured. Mm -hmm. And then like you would write a separate paper about debating because unlike arguing, which is at baseline bad, debating is at baseline good. So if you're taking a good thing and arranging mm -hmm. it differently, you're going to get a different pattern than if you're taking a bad thing and arranging it differently. Yeah, I think, yeah, certainly one could, yes. So the, the answer is one could do that. Like if, so, you know, what I'm trying to make the argument is people should be looking at this uh -huh. and developing more theory about it in terms mm -hmm. of how these different configurations will play out for the different types of conflict expressions. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I didn't do it justice in the talk today because I just wanted to make the case um, but yes, uh, but what's interesting, and I want to take your question one step further, and maybe this is where you're going, is that in any one team, they don't just argue or just debate or just undermine or just disguise. We do all yeah. of these things. Yeah. So in addition, you know, another way to cross cut it is, is to look at, you know, the, I, you'd need huge, a lot of power to do this, but look at the configurations of these four simultaneously, or, you know, and people have looked at the means people don't even look at the means simultaneously, but they do, right? So you could look at the means of these four simultaneously. And we tried to do that. Um, uh, when you, you introduce the configurations, it's just another level of com complexity. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. I mean, it's basically like you're saying that, you know, so far we've been saying like to be healthy, you need to eat more or eat less. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, it depends on what you're eating. Right. And what time of day you're eating it and what you're eating it with. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the the notion, and this isn't the best graph to be or table to be showing, but you know, the notion that um, I mean, these these are interesting, right? So that magnitudes are the story right, is just in terms of how a team perceives and functions is just missing a lot of the nuance of what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Haley, you wanna jump in? Sure, yeah, and so Lori, what you were just saying really gets to the heart of a question I was wondering, which is, are you viewing these conflict expression archetypes as zero sum? It sounds like you're not. Um, although we obviously have so much other else to cover that you didn't really get, we didn't really get there yet. So I'm kind of wondering whether you think about how you think about interactions among these archetypes or kind of even look at what, what correlates at a, at the very kind of most simplistic level. Right. Yeah. So, um, in terms of the four archetypes, what we see in our data sets are that, um, no, I, I don't have, I've, I, I know what these, I've worked with this so many teams. So I know what, you know, they, like when I work with a set of teams, I give feedback to the teams. We can, we can tell them here's, you know, the average, here's your, um, not configuration, but the, I'm missing the word, um, profile. Thank you. The profile of um, your team, right? In terms of argue, debate, undermine, and disguise. And we can talk through what a healthy profile looks like. You know, and so it's it. Uh, there's lots of literature that would say, you know, 
that shows that di direct is better than indirect. You know, low intensity is better than high intensity. So debate is the gold standard. What we generally see is um, undermining and disguise tend to have more negative outcomes than arguing because arguing at least is, is um, direct and sometimes it gets heated, but at least there's information flow. So, it, and what we typically see is um, those relationships with outcomes. And then we see that um, in terms of team profiles, it's really interesting. Like I've seen teams that have a lot of disguise. They're, they're conflict avoidant, right? And so they hide their disagreements right? So dis debate might be the highest, but then comes dis disguise and then argue and undermine. And sometimes undermine is higher than argue, right? Because they're very conflict avoidant. So you can think about the profile of different teams. So when you talk about the correlation, it, it's hard for me. And, and what I have, you know, and I didn't, don't have it in the slide deck, is the factor structure among the different the four types, which basically shows you the intercorrelations among the four. And what you see is that, you know, the direct approaches are correlated, the indirect are correlated, the high intensity are correlated, and the low intensity are correlated, right? So we're picking up on these underlying dimensions quite nicely. Um, and if, and it depends on the, the sample to say which are going to be the strongest of the ones that are intercorrelated. Does that help to answer the question? Yeah, certainly. I think just even thinking in that direction is really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And in this paper that I had sent out, we um, and in the supplement, we have all the data on the um, factor structures and, and the correlations among the different scales in big samples. So, yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. So I have, we have a little bit of time left. Let me quickly tell you about what we're working on now. Uh, it also, so what I've just presented to you is in a paper that's under review. We're currently trying to then think about, <laughs> move away from the experiences and say, well, if everything's an experience, then is there any reality? And of course there is reality. How do we capture objective levels of conflict expression, right? Is there a way that a omniscient party can capture this? And what we find in this is that while with individuals who are participating, they can't tell you how direct or intense but coders can. Like if I'm if I'm reading a transcript or looking, I can start coding how direct a communicate conflict expression is and how intense it is. Um, and what we also are finding is that we're then able to train a machine to do the to cap to capture these in terms of directness and intensity. Okay, so here the questions are: Can they be reliably coded? Uh, do these things predict a conflict escalation? And can, can a machine be taught to do it? All right, so I'm gonna just go through this relatively quickly. This is a work in progress. This is the stuff we're doing with Mike Yemens. Not surprising, right? Okay, so I, we, we spent many, many hours developing a coding manual for, uh, to train people, humans, on uh, what is a subversive statement look like? What does defense, defensiveness look like? clarity, other person, directness, intensity, whole coding manual. So, you know, I'll just read through one. So for example, in terms of intensity subversiveness, the intensity of conflict expression is influenced by how much one's communications of opposition attacks the other party and or subverts or undermines their position. Um, so that's the subversion piece. The And then we have examples and, and so on. And we had rating scales and we had Multiple coders go through these in different configurations. I'm going to talk about the data set in a second. Okay, so we can have human coders use this, what we call this. This is what we're now calling the dice, Jared. We used to call the other thing the dice, but now this is directness and intensity of conflict expression. So this is now their new name for the coding manual. Okay, so the first question is, can humans code this reliably? So this is the, here they coded a data set that some of you might be familiar with. Um, it's an existing published data set um, that um, scraped Wikipedia to find examples of threads with personal attacks in the talk pages of popular articles, right? So, um, so each thread, you know, there was a thread they find that contained a personal attack, and then the authors identified another thread for in this from the same article, similar length and day, that didn't contain a personal attack. 
And so there was kind of this matched pair control design. Um, and then uh, they could be coded. So this, you know, is I think this was, you guys use this for politeness, like Mike might've used it for politeness coding, but we used it, we went back to the same data set and said, can, can we use it to pick up the intensity of their conflict expression? Uh, it was a beautiful data set. And so when we trained our humans, we had pretty good reliability for all the categories, except di directness general. And that's because these two subcomponents are pretty different from each other. Is there, are you talking to a third person or are you clear in your communication? So putting those together didn't work quite so well. Okay, so, so we can, humans can reliably code intensity and directness of conflict expression, at least with our coding manual. All right, now the next question is, do these codes predict conflict escalation? Remember, so we have turns that, or threads that escalate and those that don't. And the answer was a re uh, resounding yes. So we, first we controlled for the length of the interaction, the number of people who were involved in the interaction. And then here's in the, uh, here's the first model just had the high level intensity and directness and the predictive power. And then we re-ran it just with the four subdimensions, okay? And predictive power. So we're seeing that, yes, we're getting some traction here in terms of human coding of these things. All right. Uh, and then, of course, we wanted to see, well, can we teach a machine to do this? Because that is incredibly labor intensive. So, of course, we have to train the machine to the humans and then see if it can it can predict the escalation. And um, so I'm not going to get into the model here, but basically, you know, the approach here in the machine coding is to look for these phrases that are called engrams, like which are, um, boy, I hope, I know there's gonna probably someone in this call that knows this better than I do, but um, of different lengths that can be predictive. And then word counts, sentiments, and um, you know, potentially politeness is what they, he originally did. We started looking at, I think it was a control for politeness in addition to our engrams. So can we predict? Okay, all right, this is what engrams look like. I am gonna skip this to show you the predictive power. So here is first the correlation between the machine, the natural language processing and the humans. So other person didn't work so well, the machine had a hard time picking that up, who would they were referring to in the conflict, who they were talking to or about. But um, otherwise, this is the intent, oh, sorry, I'm pointing the wrong thing. This is the intensity and defensiveness and here's directness clarity, okay? And then this is just another measure of the human human reliability, but we clustered them a slightly differently. So I want to present it again. So the so they're they're approximating at least with in, um, the intensity and the directness clarity. Okay. Now the and this is you know these maps of what features these are the kind of the engrams that predicted intensity. I'm not going to. I have defensiveness too, but or directness. Um, some, you know, so the higher intensity and um, phrases are there. You can screen some of them, right? Um, rude, uh, they're referring to the other person. You, you are, um, there's some profanity, uh, threat and so on. And then kind of the other end is uh, work phrases like, I agree, hi, thank you. Uh, feel free, you know, so on and so forth, right? Okay. Um, this is predicting directness. So there's a lot that predict high directness. Um, let the interestingly, the profanities or the name calling were the predicted some of the low directness, um, you know, but the more direct were, for, you know, words like agree, actual, you know, I mean, how these come work exactly works, I don't know. All right, what I wanna show you though, is that um, do they predict personal attacks? And the answer is interestingly, yes. And almost as good as the human codes do, right? So yeah, this is predicting, um, so this is the human codes of intensity predicting whether this the, the thread ended in a personal attack or not, okay? And uh, you know the, the algorithm on intensity did a pretty good job. Other person was significant as well. Uh, directness, pretty similar to the human codes. 
right? So interesting that the phrases and the model is being able to um, predict attacks. So, you know, and whether or not they're going to occur. So we're getting a little bit of traction there as well. Lori? Yeah. Um, so Jared had an interesting question in the chat um, that I wanted to uh, bring up, but also follow up on. So Jared's question was, do we know anything about the cultural background of the coders? Because that would, of course, influence Mm -hmm. what they think is direct or indirect or, right. or not. Yeah, so it's the coders and the code manual writers, uh -huh. right? Because so, in, you know, this is all about developing coding schemes and what you're trying to, um, you know, what's reality, right? Because you're trying to code reality and you're trying to say to the coders, here's such, such a good tight definition, then when you apply it, you're going to do it the same way as someone else. Like that's a good coding manual. So the, the question is also about the Western view that we have in writing this. So interestingly, the writers, the manual were um, uh, Korean and American. Uh, the coders were all, um, uh, they were Asian American and European Americans. Um, there were no international in, um, coders in this for this data set, but um, but we had to work hard to train the coders to see things the way we wanted to see them. So any coding manual, if if it's worth its weight, um, is directive enough that um, you you lose you that variation goes away. But so what can happen though is like one person can always be a little higher than the other. And that's okay. As long as the variation is the same, it's okay. So if I see everything is a little more intense than you do, but we're correlating well, then I'm getting reliability. But if you sometimes see it high and I sometimes see it low and we keep flip-flopping around, um, run into problem. What we ended up doing in the codes for the hum for the predictions is average them together saying, well, the reality is at the intersection of all their codes. So hopefully, you know, there's some people are higher, some people are lower and we can average them together. And which is a approach I'd suggest using in this type of situation. So yes, it's a Western approach and it would be different. Well, but to follow up on that, right? One of the things that made me, that question made me realize, so so yeah, so you're right, we use this data set in the conversational receptiveness paper. Um, I don't actually know who are the groups talking in the data set. I mean, there are, you know, people who edit Wikipedia. Right. Uh, they're editing Wikipedia in English. So I'm assuming that they're mostly culturally Western people. Uh, and so then, if we're predicting what makes those people call each other nasty names, then we should be using Western cultural standards to identify what we mean by conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the two approaches that I have in this talk are diametrically opposed in terms of what we think about as, as reality, right? Mm -hmm. I think, because you know, one is saying it's the lived experience that matters in terms of then affecting the group process and outcome. And the other is saying, no, there's some nugget here of what's really happening through our Western lens or whatever lens we wanna use, right? And, and, and both have validity. And it's a combination that is probably the most, you know, I think the most. Well, but the second, the second study actually ties it together quite nicely, right? Because you have, you have mm -hmm. coders' perceptions. You know those are in some way reliable because the algorithm is picking up on them. And then if they right. predict personal attacks in the Wikipedia right. data, that means that those coder perceptions do map onto some right. real experience people right. are having that make them attack each other. No, that's right, right, that's right, that's right. So, but would the participants perceive it? I don't know. What they're, I mean, look, some of this, you saw the data sets, some of it's pretty egregious, right? <laughs> some of the behavior. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at how um, the coding maps 
So, and, and looking at, you know, receptiveness might be interested, politeness might be interesting, you know, and looking at how those map onto one another. So this is just, you know, kind of one slice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you guys ever tried, sorry, have you ever okay. tried, I mean, now that you have the algorithmic measure of conflict expression, I'd be shocked if Mike hadn't tried to run it with politeness to see, uh, not with receptiveness to see how they're correlated. I mean, to me, they seem like almost inverses of each other. Yeah, I don't know if he's tried to run those in a model together. You know, you saw the, the, this, he had polite, <laughs> this I got from Mike. It has uh -huh. politeness in here. So politeness might be in this model. <laughs> Literally, like, this is why we have not written this up yet. And right. so I actually got this from him last week. And <laughs> he's putting, yeah, so I'm like, oh, I didn't want to delete that because I'm like, oh, is politeness in this model? So he must know how, I, and I believe that the two things are, you know, going to be correlated. But I'm, I, I, what I'm believing is, you know, po the politeness measure is also predictable. I, then I got to get more clarity on that. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's what I've got here. I have a summary slide, but it's we've kind of worked through a lot of these points. You know, again, what what my goal was today, and I, you know, as as people drop off the talk because it, I know it's a very narrow kind of takeaway here, is um, is that we need to pay attention to how people express conflict and we and experience conflict and capture the complexity of it. And I think more and more conflict researchers who are in the communication domain, like you all, like many of you are doing that. And it's so exciting for me to see that as like maybe one of the pioneers in OB. I won't say in, in scholarship because communication scholars have been doing this for years, but to, you know, we, we moving this into social psychology and organizational behavior to say, oh, we're really going to look at these you know, communication in a way that um, uh, in these work teams and teams in general that we haven't done before. And it's, it's tractable and, and, and the tool, as the tools move forward, there's more and more we can do. So very exciting. Um, Lori, there is a question in the chat that I think is like the perfect Kennedy School question to finish this with, uh, which is how do we use this insight to make teams and meetings work better? Uh, what's like the MBA takeaway? <laughs> yeah, I think the MBA takeaway for this one is that when you have a team that is, or when you have an experience, let's talk about from the individual's perspective, you have an experience in your team that you feel like there's a lot of arguing going on or that you're getting too, uh, you're hiding things. Look for the person who's the outlier. Find that, my, look for the person who's different and um, make sure that their experience influences the team dynamic. So if there's the person who's, I like to think about argue, let's say, so, and this is an interesting one. If one person is not experiencing a lot of arguing and the others are, can you pull that person into the dynamic more in order to get their, to benefit from their difference? How, you know, so how can we leverage the differences in the team in terms of their conflict expression behaviors and and experiences so i would say that that's one thing differences are okay usually we say well we're you know everyone should be the same but differences especially when you're in a negative dynamic are good because the person who's potentially in the positive can help the rest of the team get back on track so that would be my takeaway and i know it's behavioral instead of experience but i think that you know, that's what you, you're going to leverage because that's all you can see as a team member. You can't see the experiences, but you can see the behaviors. Fabulous. Thank you. All right. Thank so, you so much. So do you want me to talk about the book real quickly in my last couple of minutes? Oh, sure. We'd love all to right. hear about the book. I'll do that. And I should, I was going to put a slide at the end. I thought, oh no, that would be like to, uh, <laughs> right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen though. So I can see everyone. Okay. Um, all right, so the other thing that um, I'm working on right now is a book called The No Club, Putting a Stop to Women's Dead-End Work. And this book focuses on um, our research. And I think Linda Babcock, Julia pointed out, came to talk about the research from a few years ago that started us down this path. Um, recognizing the fact that we all do work that doesn't advance our careers. Uh, for, as faculty, we do service, right? Service is a big part of our 
day to day, but it's not necessarily included in our performance evaluations. Uh, all professions, all jobs have non-promotable work. The problem is that women tend to be burdened with more of it than their male counterparts. People of color also tend to be burdened with it uh, than their counterparts. And um, it holds back careers and it leads to stress and work overload. And it's bad for organizations because they're not fully leveraging their workforce. So when you have to spend a lot of time doing non-promotable tasks, you have less time to do the work that matters for your career, or you just have to work longer hours in order to keep up with your, your peers who are not similarly burdened. What I'm telling you is probably not surprising in terms of non-promotable tasks, or maybe that women are doing more of it. But um, what we found is that um, there's many people who don't understand the scope and scale of the problem. They think that there's nothing that can be done about it. It's just the way things are. And our message is that it can be changed. And we, in our book, we focus on many different ways that we can affect change. So what women can do to manage it for themselves and anyone can use this advice. Uh, we talk to women in the book, but that's where, um, because it's our lived experience. Um, we uh, also talk about how women can spark change in their organizations from a bottom-up kind of grassroots approach. We talk about what, why organizations should care about the problem and what managers and organizational leaders can do to affect change just across the board so that the allocation of work is more equitable and uh, the work gets done. Non-promotable work is really important to the functioning of an organization but it doesn't advance careers. So let's make sure everybody's doing it. And that includes office housework that you've all kind of read about, like you know, taking notes at meetings and planning office parties, but it also includes the hidden work that is done behind the scenes, like resolving conflicts and amongst your peers or, um, or doing philanthropic work, organizing team building events, um, taking notes at the meeting, putting the PowerPoint deck together, staying in the background so someone else can be in the foreground, all of those things. So that's that's my three minute book pitch. Anyway, the all books right. comes out in May. And so we've just been starting to work on uh, promoting it and all that. Okay, well, I've put the link to the book into the chat since you were so modest and didn't put it in your slides. Uh, we, we did it for you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it, yeah. Sounds, it sounds uh, so interesting and something that I will certainly be uh, assigning as reading in my class. <laughs> well, if any, anyone wants to uh, learn more about it, we have a website too. That's the noclub.com. And, um, and then if anyone wants like, you know, to have a talk on our, our big events where we're, we're doing those too. It's all good. It's all fun. It's fun stuff. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope that for the, you know, it was useful for those of you kind of studying conflict in this very um, detailed way that you found this useful. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, we will see everybody back uh, for our March session. All right, great. Take care. Bye-bye. And Thank good you. luck. Hope you don't get too much snow. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks so much. This was great. Thank you um, Thanks, both Sarah. to Laurie and to Julia for putting this together. Thanks. Thanks so much.